Welcome to all of you joining us. Hi, I'm Brent Shea from the class of 1978, and I'm honored to serve as president of our Society of Alumni. Thank you for being here for today's Zoom cast with Williams College President Maud S. Mandel. Our conversation will, as always, offer us a chance to hear from Maud directly. She plans to share her perspective on campus life, the ongoing implementation of the strategic plan, and a handful of topics she has identified as being important to illuminate. And then we'll open the conversation to your questions. A few reminders to our alumni audience before we dive in. Please use the chat as space to engage with the community and share any reflections or comments you may have. And if you have any questions for Maud, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar at, at any time during today's talk. We have dedicated much of our time to Q&A and you can submit your questions as you think of them. So with that, let's get started. Maud, as always, it's an honor to be with you. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Brent. Um, uh, my pleasure. So here we are mid-October with our newest East from the class of 2026, having just arrived on campus six short weeks ago. What was your key piece of advice you shared with incoming first years and their families? And, 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 and could you share some insights from the start of the academic year in general? Sure. Thank you. And thanks again for being here. And thanks to everybody who's uh, tuned in from um, out there in, uh, in our alumni community. It's always great to have an opportunity to chat with everybody. Um, so I actually give somewhat different advice to, to students and parents. I have different um, meetings with each when they come. Um, and uh, to parents, I've really tried to emphasize that they support their students in taking intellectual risks um, and to exploring. So to encourage parents also um, to, to uh, empower their students actually to solve problems on their own um, and to get out uh, there and um, engage with faculty and um, jump into the broad range of things that they, the parents and the students thought they would be interested in, but also the new things and really to encourage the, the autonomy and the self-direction um, of the student, which is so much of what college is about. Um, and that's really a big part Part of my message to, to parents. Um, to students, actually, what I really try to emphasize this year, but it's a message that I, um, I, I really give every incoming class, which is that, you know, we, we focus a lot in higher ed these days, and I certainly am uh, well known for focusing uh, on, on the diversity of our community. It's a really big part of what uh, coming to college is these days, as you really interact with a lot of people uh, from different backgrounds. Um, but I really like to stress at the beginning that whatever uh, a student's background or interests or beliefs um, uh, or identity, that when they come to college, they're entering into a joint project of learning and expanding their intellectual horizons and of challenging themselves to test their assumptions uh, that, that perhaps they've never questioned before. And that that is actually the liberal arts proposition, that no matter where you come from, um, how you were raised or what you believe, you're part of a wider community of learners who are working to extend the boundaries of human knowledge. And this is really a joint project um, as the collective opportunity that we are all engaged in to extend what is known about the world and the universe. Um, and one could argue, I often say to them, it's humanity's greatest transnational experiment that a project that has crossed ages uh, and continents and connects them not only with their fellow Williams students, but with learners all over the world. And so I really try to give them uh, that sort of framing for the project they're engaged in um, uh, as they leap into their what ends up being very personal and um, in specific pathways of exploration that they're embarking on that just sort of to run, remind them kind of the big why of why we all do this and, and, and what the point is, the larger point of expanding the boundaries of human knowledge. Um, as for uh, campus this semester, I've, I've had the great pleasure of teaching a class myself, which I try to do um, as often as possible. The pandemic um, interrupted uh, that, uh, so I haven't been able to do it every year, but I have gotten back in the classroom this year, which means I've really been able to see on the ground um, what, what's happening which has been uh, really exciting for me, um, and I hope for the students, um, but certainly for me, uh, to, I'm teaching an upper level research seminar. Um, the energy on campus this semester is very good. I think um, the uh, 
you know, each year past 2020 has been a little more engaged and a, a, so a little back to something that um, we all find familiar, but also is all the more, I think, welcome and celebrated. Uh, given having lost it for a stretch of time, so uh, it's been uh, it's been a, quite exciting and and fun to be on campus and engaging in all of the um, intellectual, academic, co curricular, athletic, musical you know the, the all the things that students do so well. I think we had you know over six hundred students up on Mount Greylock for Mountain Day, and you know just a lot of a lot of energy. So that's been really that's been really wonderful. Wow, wow that's great, and we, we love that you're back in the classroom too, that's good. Uh, our next question is, uh, most of our audience is aware of the strategic planning process you began early in your tenure back in 2018. Um, I know from my recent visits to campus that the college is now deep into the implementation of the plan. Uh, would you share some specific insights on how that process is proceeding? Um, yeah, happily, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, so the goal for that plan was really to create uh, something for the next decade or, um, or so to strengthen Williams um, and to respond to the changing world. So uh, the technological advancements of our society, uh, the increase in globalization um, and the emerging needs of societies and their employers, including around uh, sustainability and diversity, um, equity and inclusion and a lot of the things that um, are, current students are grappling with. So on the one hand, they are uh, engaging in that transnational timeless um, educational adventure that I was describing in my answer to my last question. On the other hand, they're graduating into a world that is um, their own uh, and is one that is very particular to this moment as each one is. Uh, and so providing them with um, building on William's current and historic strengths uh, in a way that allows them to be prepared for these um, pressures that they in particular will be facing. Um, and as part of that, the plan really focused, as I noted, on our strengths, um, but also uh, and building on that strength and building on that excellence uh, into um, a new era. So there is a focus on um, the arts uh, throughout the plan. Anybody who uh, knows even a little bit about Williams knows um, the significance of um, the art historical tradition here, the uh, curatorial program, um, and also the ways in which so many of our students who come here for an excellent liberal arts education become themselves um, very deeply engaged in uh, liberal arts defined broadly in that sense. So really strengthening our arts program. Um, it, likewise, science and math has been a big core um, uh, of strength of excellence of this institution. And the plan um, is very focused through uh, in connection to um, technology and the liberal arts to thinking about how to build out and continue to expand our students' facility with computational skills, uh, data, uh, and how to think about those things in um, the wider society in which they're uh, participating. Um, we have a big emphasis on access and affordability, which um, I hope uh, folks have heard about our all grant financial aid policy um, that uh, we launched last year and that picks up on William's long tradition in that area. Um, there's a, a quite a significant emphasis on learning by doing, um, which is embedded in William's history in winter in the winter study programs and in the Gaudino programs and the and our strategic plan again leans into that history uh, of excellence and expands upon it. And of, of course, above all, um, and it almost goes without saying, but it, but I will never not say it, which is um, teaching and learning at an intimate scale. Uh, and so the plan again there seeks through um, fostering uh, ongoing. Um, development of our tutorial programs and uh, other um, research opportunities that give students hands-on learning experiences directly from faculty in small settings, which is really in many ways um, the core of a Williams education. So since that plan was released last summer, we've made progress on many of the major initiatives outlined in it because it was a 10 to 15 year plan um, that has ranged in sort of speed of completion with some things launching and other things uh, really close to completion and everything in between. Um, and in many cases, faculty working groups are now operationalizing proposals that were in the plan, particularly around academic programs, faculty positions uh, to support curricular initiatives, et cetera. Um, but uh, some of those that I might just note that um, 
some of our listening audience will have heard about through um, various other communications over the last several months. Uh, uh, certainly, we've made progress on the um, building of our new um, Williams College Museum of Art, and we're in the currently in the um, design phase of that project uh, with our, the wonderful architects, um, the Soiel architects that we hired uh, in the process of um, considering different designs for what is really, um, and I, I like to uh, stress this every time I, I speak, um, I think if we use the word museum, it's a legible word people understand, but what it really is is an educational um, space for the arts, much the way uh, our educational spaces for the sciences manifest themselves in the science center. Um, and so uh, WICMA is a teaching museum with the emphasis on uh, both of those words. Um, and thinking of this new museum as um, a, a state-of-the-art educational space right-sized for this college is really, I think, the right way to think about that project. So our architects really understand that, um, and they're in the process of uh, designing a facility that would be appropriate for that. Um, we also have uh, an augmented Davis Center facility supporting multicultural student life and programs on campus. Um, and that uh, that's a project that's really focuses on fostering campus inclusion and dialogue across difference. Uh, and happily that project is moving along very nicely um, with plans, wide support from our alumni community and plans to um, open that building, uh, I think a year from January, all continuing to go as, as is happening, which uh, is going well. Um, I already touched very briefly on our all grant financial aid policy and initiatives to recruit um, particularly non-traditional students, including military veterans and community college transfers, which is uh, an outgrowth of our work in the access and affordability work um, of the strategic plan. Um, and here to the, um, uh, that, that is an example of one of our strategic initiatives that was uh, launched last year. Um, and this is the first year of a cohort of students that's able to fully participate in all Williams programs through uh, at this at the same level as each other through that um, initiative is really exciting. And we've gotten a lot of wonderful um, feedback around that. Um, we've launched a new teaching center to continue to build um, and grow the pedagogical uh, craft of our faculty here. Um, the Rice Center, which opened this fall um, under faculty uh, leadership and is a really nice um, professional development space for faculty uh, and, again, helps us continue to grow the capacities for uh, all of our educators here in those key uh, teaching um, relationships that they have with students and which is so core to a, a Williams uh, education. Um, and, and so very much more uh, that I can talk about and hopefully we'll have a chance to do in the question and answer period. Um, I should just note as one very big part of the strategic plan, we have a whole section on the role of alumni um, and uh, the Society of Alumni, as you know, um, has been engaged in its own I seem to have gotten muted. Can you hear me? Did that just, uh, I, I, did that just, just happen? Okay. Yes, you just came back. Yes. Okay. I don't know why I actually didn't touch my computer, so I don't know how that happened. But um, <laughs> you'd think by now we'd all be masters of this, but that was by telepathy. I didn't. I didn't actually push any buttons. Um, so I was just saying that how central um, alumni also are to our strategic planning and thinking and that the Society of Alumni has done its own strategic planning that's aligning with the larger college um, thinking uh, about the future. But this is really a, a point that we, we also don't take um, alumni engagement for granted, but in fact, see it as a, a key part of thinking about the um, ongoing strength of the of Williams going forward. So, so um, perhaps I'll stop there um, and turn it back to you and to, to questions. Um, from our viewers. okay thank you um and just on that point to the um alumni audience just a reminder that uh the q a function please use that if you want to ask a question to maud and we'll, we'll try and pick them up uh there, there are a number of questions here so i'm, I'm going to start right uh here's the first one uh, can you walk us through please the, the changes that have happened with the entry and ja system over the, the last several years Sure. Um, some of these actually were changing just as I came in, um, and some have happened since I, I got here. So it's probably worth noting, so the JA system is a beloved part of the Williams culture here uh, and continues to be. Um, 
And I think that's been a core commitment of the institution for decades uh, and continues to be one um, under my presidency as well. Uh, when I arrived here, I heard a lot from current JAs about some of the challenges that, um, that were embedded in that position um, in, uh, that were, again, sort of already here when I got here, um, one of which was at least in that year, and this hasn't been a constant in that, since then, but in that year, they were actually ha having struggling enough that they were actually having um, a hard time getting a full cohort of applicants. So that changed one part of the uh, JA entry system, which was um, the way the actual sort of space and teams were organized um, into sort of larger units um, around uh, teams of JAs. And that's that's actually worked very well, and they've kept it even as uh, the numbers of applicants have gone back up. The other big two other things that we heard, and these really have happened more since I got here. Uh, first thing we heard is that um, given rising questions around um, mental health on college campuses at Williams and elsewhere, um, given um, some of the other uh, issues that can emerge in campus life um, that student leaders didn't necessarily feel equipped fully uh, to address, um, there was a desire for more support. Um, and so one of the ways that we provided that support was to provide um, additional staff in the res, res life space uh, who work with the JAs. So they don't, they're not, they don't live in the dorms. Um, there are four um, area coordinators uh, and one of whom is particularly targeted to work with the JAs um, to be sort of a liaison between them and other support systems on the college that they need um, in particularly sticky moments, particularly when in the evenings and weekends when other staff Staff and faculty aren't around campus. Um, and uh, and uh, that's been um, in place. This is, I believe, the second year of the area coordinators um, and has been a nice addition for just supporting the JAs in their work. Uh, the other major change that happened came this year through a tremendous amount of advocacy from the JAs um, that those positions must be stipended. And I know listening audiences don't always agree that that is, uh, was the right move for this um, for this uh, prior, I've heard from al alumni from prior generations that um, they're concerned about uh, the impact of that, but it really uh, is something that current JAs had advocated for very strongly while simultaneously wanting to clarify that the role remained a student run program and not sort of employees of the college because of a, of a stipending situation. So we did a lot of work um, working that through last year and this is the first cohort that is um being compensated for the for the work um, and that's gone over very um uh i think well in the in the ja class um and, and among other things helps to encourage um uh, diversity of applicants to that position because in, students who are on financial aid who um or come from high need backgrounds who uh really do need paying work um it sort of opens up the door for greater participation Okay, th thank you. Uh, our next question um, is the Maitland Jones episode at NYU. That, that recently posed the issue of students as consumers versus students as learners and the role of faculty. H how does our institution manage the priorities of intellectual rigor, extracurricular, social, political engagement, et cetera, and, and the pressures from students to get grades they deserve, quote unquote. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question. I, so for, for starters, the kind of question of students as consumers, of course, that, that case may be um, uh, sort of directed a light on the problem, um, but I think it's actually been true now for a long time that the, the um, and one, as a historian, I often think about sort of turning points and how how our institutions have changed over time. Um, and this this particular reality, a kind of greater focus on grades and um, and on something one might call a, a kind of consumer relationship to higher education, has really been building for a long time. Um, so. One of the great things about Williams, I would say, though, is despite that, it, it lives in that environment and is part and is subject to the same pressures as other institutions. And you know, of course, we are. Um, there is something about the size of the school and the um, faculty to student ratio that I think um, mitigates the problem somewhat here. And in part, it's because um, students are just in smaller classes. I mean, the faculty to student ratio is notable in its 
small size, right? So we have somewhere between six to seven students per faculty member at Williams, which means that although students are sometimes in larger classes and sometimes in smaller classes, they have just a lot of hands-on learning that is really built into the educational pressure. Note, I'm not really talking about grades. Students here are as concerned about grades as they are anywhere else, and they're going to engage in the same conversations and pressures and um, uh, and and focus on that that in any competitive environment. And so that's we feel that here too. Um, but I think uh, what students get here is a kind of directed attention to their learning um, that is sort of unavoidably built into the structure. And it's it's been so notable to me this year. I, I it is. Tr- you know, we experience a lot of um, academic stress at Williams, as many of our peers do. And I saw it a lot last year, actually, in particular. Um, but this year, as I've been walking around talking to students, and I, I often will say to a student, what's your favorite class? You know, and and usually the answer I get is I can't I can't pick. I like all my classes. And then, you know, they'll sort of cough out one just to answer the question. But you know, there's just a lot of um, investment in the academic program here, even as I, you know, do hear from students um, concerns about about pressure. Uh, I will say as a side note over the pandemic, Williams expanded somewhat the pass fail options uh, available to students, which is another way the institution has um, mitigated somewhat some of the uh, pressures uh, that can build up if uh, in instances where students are, are feeling very um, nervous about grades. Okay. Uh, our next question has to do with first gens. What, what percent of the student body are first generation college students? And what resources are available to help them prosper at our college? Oh, thank you so much for that question. Um, there's been a lot of attention to uh, attracting and developing the number of students at Williams who are first in their family um, to go to college. Uh, in, in this year's class, um, the incoming class, it's 19%. It's varied from year to year, but um, uh, it, that's that's very common uh, that it it hovers at around nineteen uh, percent. Um, it might be more like fourteen or 15, maybe fifteen percent now for the whole student body uh, combined. Um, but um, it, it has been a big focus of Williams for uh, quite a number of years. We have a, a dean whose um, job it is to support that population. She leads a pre-orientation program so that uh, those students who uh, come to Williams but who don't come with um, from families whose uh, p- family from parents who went to college who don't necessarily know um, some of the. Um, sort of transitional tools that are available to them on in an institution like Williams, uh, they learn about those in the pre-orientation program and then throughout the programming all four years they're here, including um, uh, you know, a real focus on bringing them together as a community because there's a lot of, of pedagogical, um, there's a lot of evidence, research-based evidence that uh, collective learning cohorts encourage um, all uh, sort of sub-communities that come from under-resourced backgrounds um, to prosper better in an academic setting if they go through in cohort environments. So there's attention not just to academic support or or sort of teaching about the transition, but also um, to building community among those students while uh, they're on campus, celebrating them when they graduate, sort of at all the stages through to recognize the significance of the accomplishment. Um, And it's um, it's really an exciting population to work with. Uh, but uh, just to give an example, um, I have a, I work with a, I always take first year advisees, um, and I have one um, this year who's a, uh, in our non-traditional student group, um, so we have a population of transfer students from community colleges, first gen families, um, often they're veterans, they're not necessarily all first gen, this depends uh, on the population, but one of them I'm working with is uh, both a transfer from a community college and a first gen. And he told me, and when I was talking to him about his first weeks in class, I was asking him, you know, what the experience was like. He's, I, I will say, having a great time here at Williams and it's going very well. But he said, you know, it took me a while to realize I have to raise my hand in class. Like that wasn't even a thing that, and that's really interesting right now. He comes from a, I must say, a rather atypical uh, educational background. Um, that's That wouldn't be true most of our first gen students went through sort of more standard schooling. Um, but things like what's an office hour and, you know, just kind of basic things that our um, students uh, who come from 
families where there is a, a history of academic engagement um, just sort of would know by osmosis. And so we do a lot of that kind of training and engagement um, uh, prior to the start of the experience and then continuing throughout. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Can you say um, more about the plans for the new college um, Museum of Art? Specifically, is there a plan for what will happen to our beloved Lawrence Hall in oh. the future after the new museum is completed? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, a, a plan without it being um, sort of fully fleshed out. So, so for starters, it is beloved, and nobody should assume that because we're moving Wickma that it is a it is an indication of any. Um, uh, critique of Lawrence Hall or any plans to to do anything that anybody would be sad about. <laughs> um, it's just not a great envelope for art, it turns out, um, uh, and um, it isn't the right size and scope of what, for what we need for a current um, uh, arts educational facility of the kind we've been talking about. Um, but Lawrence will very likely, it, we don't have a, a fully um, determined plan yet. Um, but um, broadly speaking, the goal is to continue its usage as an educational space for the arts. Um, uh, that is with faculty offices and classroom spaces, um, integrative arts programming of some kind potent potentially that's pulling in in an interdisciplinary way arts from um, a number of uh, parts of the campus. Um, so I, I have a, I expect it to have an arts focus um, and to be ultimately to be renovated um, itself as part of this um, focus on uh, on the arts. But it would definitely be second to the building of the museum. And and right now, you know, without a timeline or an actual design or even programmatic work yet having been done. Okay. Um, I, I guess this is a free speech question. What, what practices and initiatives does the college have in place to ensure and encourage freedom of speech and an equal voice slash platform to all points of view, particularly conservative and constitutionalist values? Um, well, let me split those into two separate questions. So the first one uh, around specifically around free speech. Um, so some who are listening might remember that when I first got there, there was a fairly robust um, debate about this very issue on campus. Uh, that led to um, some faculty, a uh, faculty committee working that wasn't faculty, it was faculty, staff and students it was a mixed co um, communal uh, committee that worked on articulating principles in a statement um, and an approach for Williams around this issue because there were a lot of um, questions actually mostly that were happening on other campuses. A little bit had happened here, a lot had happened elsewhere, but it was informed, the kind of national conversation was informing things happening at Williams. Um, and the, one of the results of that was a faculty statement that focused uh, on um, uh, absolutely endorsing uh, free expression on the campus. Um, while noting that we live in a diverse uh, community where we want to make sure that um, the expressions of public speech are done in ways that can foster learning on the campus. So building, excuse me, an, an inclusive campus that provides ways in which uh, we can engage through and across difference as we listen to a wide range of points of view. At the same time, we articulated, and you can you can find that statement if you're interested, the faculty uh, government and then the faculty body endorsed that statement and you can find it online. We also have speaker, campus speaker and uh, campus protest policies that were articulated around uh, that time or, or reiterated uh, campus postings policy, all of which were um, built uh, to encourage freedom of expression um, and uh, to make clear that Williams was a place where, um, where folks could uh, engage and where we encouraged um, the expression of a full range of ideas. So that's, um, that that is the first question. The second question is, you know, William, Williams as a cohesive whole doesn't um, create platforms for any one point of view or another. The the way speakers work on campus or or um, uh, events uh, really come from the community who live here. The things they want to hold and do and foster. Um, uh, you know, it's not driven out of the president's office. Faculty propose things. Students propose things. Um, and 
a huge percentage of those things are not political on any in any side of anything. A lot of them are what one might call, um, you know, academic, arts, uh, journalism, a whole range of of, of perspectives and and um, types of presentations in any given semester. Uh, Typically, the more political things, I guess, that we would put into that category come from student engagement on various issues and things they want to do on campus. We have a conservative students group who brings speaker to cam speakers to campus um, and uh, uh, have I have checked if any what they've done this year, but I know in past years of every semester since I've been here, they've had a steady flow of uh, programming that they have done um, to bring uh, that I guess I, I don't even want to call it one side of the because I actually believe I don't think of these as two side did issues in our society but multi sided and multi perspectives on a whole range of issues so um, but the the short answer is this tends to come to us through the interests and engagements of our community who then uh, bring a wide range of perspectives to campus. Great. Um, so. Great to attract more non-traditional students to Williams. How has the college thought about trying to attract transfer students starting from freshman year? Uh, it might help them integrate a little more easily within our community. So I'm, I'm not sure if I totally understand the question. We, we bring transfer students from all parts of their program. So the ones who transfer here from community colleges, um, which is where those most of who transfer from another institution come from a community college, they actually have the choice when they come to Williams of whether they want to sort of transfer all their credits and pick up where they left off. Um, they can also relinquish credits and start over. Um, and many of them choose to do that because uh, they typically come fully funded on financial aid packages that um, allow them to do a full four years if they want to do so um, in order to take a full advantage of a Williams program. And that's really left up with advising support to an individual student to decide. Some of them are older and have reasons why they want to you know, sort of move through this a little faster. Um, others are older and don't want to move through it faster and have every desire for any reason um, that they might have to to take a longer a longer journey. Um, and that's really, again, with some careful advising left to them to to make those decisions. Um, we we do outreach to community colleges. Our admissions office is quite interested in this work and has done some significant um efforts in 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 uh, reaching out to that pool we're we're seeking to build it to about somewhere between 40 to 50 students um so with a, that is to say a cohort each year of 10 to 12 um uh and uh, and over and that's a it, it's small in number but a huge increase when i got here i think we had four uh what we call non-traditional students on campus so um i've really um been interested as has the office of admission in, in building up this um uh, community and I should I've mentioned community college, but I should say there are veterans in this population that we've also been really seeking to encourage to come to Williams, who bring a vast like the students from community college a, a vast life experience which helps diversify our campus on many uh, di um, dimensions, including age and and as I say life experience background. Um, so it's it's a wonderful addition to the campus life. They have an outsized impact, I would say, on the campus life. What are opportunities for international study and research for undergraduates? Has interest in international education waxed or waned recently? Mm. It's a great question and um, and a little hard to put a, an exact answer on, in part because the... Um, it, I mean, it plummeted uh, during the heart of the pandemic. And so in, in my short time, this I'm in my fifth year, and my if I was just taking my four years here as a kind of bellwether of international study, I have to say it's quite, um, um, your curators have sort of gone up and down. It's very, uh, in very dramatic ways. Uh, it seems to be building uh, back up again. Um, there are lots of opportunities in a normal year that has not been affected by the pandemic. A very large number of the junior class study abroad, um, several hundred students, and um, they go all over the place. Williams only sponsors two study away programs of its own, the Oxford program and the program in Mystic, Connecticut, which of course not abroad, but is a really robust uh, Williams sponsored study away program. Um, but students study it away all over the globe in um, partner programs where they can transfer credit and financial aid. 
so they go to a wide range of locations um, and uh, engage in all kinds of linguistic work. We're also seeking through the strategic plan to continue to build um, international internship opportunities, particularly in summers uh, when um, students have time to do that kind of work um, and learn by doing in a, in a sort of in a different way um, than they might if they were on an, um, a more um, typical study away program that was semester based or language based. So, um, so I would say both of those things. And, and in fact, one of the strategic plan initiatives is um, we're trying to build um, under some faculty leadership, a global studies program, which would be a cohort based program that students could apply into where they would um, use, uh, where they would do um, a, a sort of focused international work as a kind of core a linking theme across their four years of college. So it would include some intensive language study in the summer. It might include study, but certainly include study abroad. It might include, um, uh, and, you know, an internship as of the kind I mentioned, um, and that would kind of arc the four years around a global experience. So we're, we're developing plans for that uh, uh, as we, as we speak. Here's uh, does this, does this, Strategic planning process include greater emphasis on preparing students for PhD programs. <laughs> That's a great, greater <laughs> emphasis than before. I have greater, greater emphasis than I, I would, what I, I would say faculty would love more students to go get uh, doctorates, but I'm not sure our students all want that. Um, I, students who want to get a PhD who are graduating from Williams um, are well positioned to do that. And we have a, I would say, a probably consistent percentage of the senior class who either go directly onto that or take a year or two off um, and then uh, apply for uh, doctoral work subsequently. Um, Williams is a phenomenal education for somebody who wants to go do doctoral work. So I don't, it actually, even before the strategic plan, I would say if, if you want to go on and get a PhD and, and you're um, coming out of Williams, you're very well positioned, um, presuming you did the undergraduate coursework here that you needed to do uh, in order to move on. And in fact, we've had very um, notable success uh, um, recent data has shown that was actually research not conducted by Williams in positioning um, Black students over many years in doctoral programs at a very, very high rate um, relative to our peers. And I, I use that just as one data point, but I think we are um, we're fostering lots of pathways uh, through Williams into the academy if that's a route that people want to go. Um, I should note and uh, report, I think it was just today and actually don't remember if it was the Chronicle or, or Inside Higher Education, noting the drop-off in numbers of students that want to go into uh, PhD programs. So um, in fact, uh, the question is well-timed in that um, if we wanna continue to build robust pipelines into those programs, we'll have to continue to um, make clear um, what those pathways are and, um, and, uh, and the benefits of, of doing that. Uh, can you now talk about admissions, specifically legacy applicants? Amherst and some others have eliminated legacy status as a point of consideration when reviewing applications. Does Williams plan to do the same? Um, thank you for that question. Um, before I answer it, I should note this is, uh, and I, I always say this when somebody asks me about this question, when I'm talking to a large group of uh, Williams, alumni. I, this is a topic that I'm, I'm asked about a lot, and my main um, uh, comment um, sort of in framing it before I go forward is that I'm asked about it a lot, and I, I hear a very diverse range of points of view uh, on the topic. Um, so my suspicion is, you know, among those listening today, there's probably people who think Williams should keep legacy admissions and people who think Williams should do away with it, um, which is also true for what it's worth at Amherst um, and uh, became quite clear after that decision was made. Um, so I, I just say that to say that um, this is one of those areas where uh, the community is um, uh, sort of, um, there, there's not clear consensus, uh, just even probably to those of you listening, from those of you listening today. Um, broadly speaking, um, I would also want to say, again, before I go right into answering this question, that the anything I the admissions landscape is changing dramatically in the United States. 
Um, and this year in particular, there's going to be a Supreme Court case um, on affirmative action in admissions, which is going to change admissions again. So I can talk to what Williams has done up until this point. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I suspect the that admissions is an area where um, all institutions are going to be evolving quite a lot in the years to come. Um, so with that as a, as a sort of disclaimer, I would say that um, Williams has had a legacy program and continues to have and is committed to having one right now. Um, it's, it's brought in um, approximately uh, the same number of applicant of uh, legacy students um, every year for many, many years. So I've heard people say that it's gone down, it's gone up, neither is true. It's been, it's been pretty consistent over time. Um, and um, it is really grounded in a philosophy of all things being equal, we will consider legacy. So that is um, to say there's not a legacy bump for um, unqualified students. Our legacy students are uh, exceptionally strong students um, by any measure, um, and uh, any institution would be happy to have them. Um, and I say that because I worry sometimes that the debates around legacy admissions suggest that something's happening in that space that is that is giving uh, students who come to us that way some um, advantage that, uh, you know, above um, more qualified peers. And I just, it's really important to, to for, essentially for their sakes, to note um, the incredible talent of um, all of our students, uh, legacy or not. Um, and so all things being equal, Williams does continue to look at that as one of many um, criteria that we look in. It never in and of itself is a reason we would let a student in, um, but it's also uh, one data point in all the data points we look at when we look at a, an applicant. We have a question about athletic facilities. Is there a plan to update the field house and the hockey rink? Ah, thank you for the question. So um, one part of strategic planning, actually there are two parts of strategic planning that speak to this question. The first is, um, uh, you know, a real recognition of the significance of um, athletics for um, the Williams College, Williams College experience. 40% of our students are varsity athletes. Um, it is a, you know, a very, and then many, many students are not varsity athletes, but still very actively involved in um, our PE program, in our outing club, in, um, in just living a, a healthy life through being physically active. And so there's athletics, sort of formal athletics, and then there's the whole kind of structure of physical well-being that goes into ensuring that a student has a wonderful experience here and, you know, healthy, healthy body, healthy mind sort of going together uh, throughout the college experience. So there's a, rec a real recognition of the central centrality of, of that in a kind of broader focus on integrative well-being in the strategic plan. Secondly, um, we have a lot of work in the plan around the physical infrastructure of the campus. And the first part of that was a, a proposal that um, the college moved from the strategic planning process into a, a campus plan um, process that is specifically focused on kind of next steps in the physical um, makeup of the camp. Like what would what should be our next capital projects? Where where are the right investments? Where are the pressure points on the campus? So we've been engaged in that process for the last year. It's it's coming to completion, although it's not done. Um, and one of the um, recommendations, and it's really meant to be a blueprint for the future. It's not a master plan. It doesn't mean it's not a document you'd look at and say, you know, in 20 years, Williams is going to have all these 15 new buildings and these buildings will be gone. It's not it's not a master plan in that sense, but it's a blueprint to help us think about um, investments. And one of the key uh, findings that's perhaps not surprising to the person who asked this question is that um, that areas of um, athletics and, um, and, and well-being sort of, again, defined broadly, are, are really in one of the areas of emphasis that the college um, should be thinking about in the next uh, phase of its development. So that was a lot of words to say, yes, I, I don't want to say specifically this building or, you know, in X year, we're going to build this thing. But, um, but I would say the energy of this plan is taking us forward to, um, to thinking about that as a next or one of a kind of couple of key areas that really need focus and attention. Our next question is a DEI question. Um, initiatives in diversity, inclusiveness, equity, and accessibility have created a multitude of valuable microcultures at Williams College. What practical actions are you leading 
towards creating a cohesive, effective culture consisting of shared common values and behaviors for which Williams is the gold standard, quote unquote. Um, so, so Williams is um, uh, built around a common, a set of common values, I would say, that actually I hope are articulated strongly in the strategic plan. First and foremost, I'm not really sure this is what the question means, but I, I or speaking to, but I just, for me, it's really important because it goes back to the first thing that I said, the most important uh, value of the institution is to me the thing that I mentioned uh, at the outset, which is that um, building of a community of learning, uh, open-minded, broad um, intellectual engagement and you know fellowship defined broadly around that educational mission. Uh, that core value is built into everything we do. Um, it's why I emphasize it to students in the first five minutes they're here and um, is wound through all of our academic programming um, and our co-curricular programming as well. Um, and and I, I hardly think you could spend a five minutes here as a student without understanding that you were part of that project. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, the shared values um, that are wound through the strategic plan on um, supporting an inclusive community uh, is something we um, work on all the time here, um, when you live in diverse communities, you almost by definition are constantly talking across difference. Uh, and so the uh, there's a lot of programming and thinking about how to do that successfully and what to do when it doesn't happen successfully, which is uh, often a reality in diverse communities. So that's another core shared value. Um, we have a core shared value right now around um, our focus on building a sustainable uh, campus. Some of you may have read the letter the provost sent out recently about the annual, we sort of send that out each year, but the annual investment in, uh, in that um, work and it, that includes um, uh, educating students in uh, the realities of living uh, in um, the world they're graduating into and how they can make a difference um, in uh, sustainable in dealing with the climate crisis and investing in sustainable work. Um, we, uh, beyond that, beyond those core values, I would say there's another um, value about living in community together um, successfully that sort of is an offshoot of the one that I was just talking about uh, around um, talking across difference. And there's, you know, a lot of just the soft work of living in community together that supports that things like Mountain Day and uh, engagement and supporting fellow students and performances and athletic uh, competitions and um, sort of joining together across all kinds of um, learning communities to launch projects together uh, that I think um, work to enforce those sets of values. How do you address experiential education, which seems to be important these days? Given the location of the college, are there any virtual opportunities? Oh, yes. So first of all, um, experience, expanding opportunities in experiential education, I would say, is um, one of several pillars of this strategic plan. Um, and uh, we, we are doing this in um, a number of ways, but I think I will... Um, maybe mention three here just in part of answering the question, and I'll, I can come back to the virtual point in a minute. The first is um, uh, through the work of our Center for Learning and Action, which is very actively um, engaged in the, mostly in the local community. They support work elsewhere too, um, through all kinds of um, experiential work, but it's also supported through our 68 uh, Center on career exploration. Um, and we have students um, every uh, summer and winter session that are um, engaged in that kind of work of, um, of experiential uh, learning through doing. So just to give an example, um, this summer we had a student who was involved in sources, sourcing and designing a clothing line um, or in uh, augmenting elementary school curriculum. Um, there was work in researching the human brain. These are just examples 
examples of some of the work that uh, and then again, this just this one summer, 202 Williams students engaged in um, with the help of alumni sponsored in the internship program, helping students uh, and do the, the learning through doing that has become so crucial to so much education. So that's really one, uh, one answer. A second is through, of course, winter study, which is, uh, has a long history at Williams as um, really a, a center of um, a different kind of experiential learning, but that usually, not always, but usually takes place on the campus um, through um, sort of non-traditional curricular experiences. Um, taught by Williams faculty or by alumni in a wide range uh, of, of um, opportunities. And then, um, as I hinted in the answer, the first, another whole kind of component of experiential learning happens in laboratories in the summer with students, mostly in the summer, but also through the academic year, with students working through with faculty to solve um, real world scientific problems uh, and other uh, problems in, um, in collaborative uh, sleeve rolling up exercises of, of, you know, really trying and like learning through what it means to be successful, but also to fail and trying to solve all kinds of complex uh, problems. Um, the question asked about specifically about um, uh, remote possibilities for doing that work. Um, and uh, we certainly do have that, particularly in winter study, there have been, and particularly at the heart of the pandemic, quite a number of opportunities to get students involved in things off campus with through online um, internships and programs uh, across the country and even globally. Um, you know, I think it almost, it, it's, it's probably worth noting that something one might call experiential learning, learning by doing the rolling up the sleeves. Uh, you know, I personally have a bias to that in-person experience. I'm probably just showing my age. I keep saying I'm very 20th century when it comes to comes to some of these questions. But um, uh, but um, but we have, of course, uh, expanded the kinds of um, opportunities available to students thanks to online platforms and particularly through the Center for Career Exploration. Um, how do you prioritize all these strategic goals? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they all yeah. need resources, some new, some redistributed, uh, but how do you make those decisions? And connected here, it says, how has the stock market drop impacted the Williams Endowment and resources available to this? Yeah, great, great questions, both of them. So one of the things I've said about the strategic plan, first of all, a note that I said it was a 10 to 15 year plan. So these are long term goals, um, some of them at really high levels, which weren't really operationally spelled out, others were more operationally spelled out, um, that also built into the plan was the point that we would only do what we could financially sustain um, and that would maintain the um, strength of the Williams, uh, the Williams financial strength, that that was a core principle of the strategic plan. Um, so, uh, so we are going to, we're going to, these are our aspirations um, and we have a nice long um, runway so that we are able to uh, move some things forward quickly and um, some things will take more time. Um, but having said that, what the strategic plan is really useful for is actually on a year to year basis as we do budgeting and thinking about our goals for a particular year, helping us figure out what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. Um, and to me, that's in some ways it's where it's most important. So as we think about, OK, you know, each year we're thinking about our budget, we're thinking, you know, what can we what are we going to stop doing so that we can focus on our strategic priorities? Where are we going to um, put our fundraising efforts? Where are we going to put our um, uh, our, our budgetary dollars. Um, and the strategic plan helps us make decisions. It's, it's probably what it's most useful for. Um, as we think, you know, almost by definition, if you were to read it, you would see that some of those things are going to take many, many, many years to accomplish, even if they are priorities. So an example would be, um, you know, as part of our sustainability work, we have a climate action plan that is grappling with heating and cooling the campus. This is a major endeavor that is going to take many years and be very expensive. Um, so even if it's a priority and it's central to the strategic plan, it, it's not a goal that will be completed in the short run. Whereas um, the launching of the teaching center, for example, or um, the all grant financial 
financial aid program were things we prioritized first, and we did them right out of the gate um, for various reasons, smaller in scale, both of them than heating and cooling the campus, but also things that um, were able that things we could do because we had already done a lot of the strategic thinking and work that would allow us to move those uh, initiatives forward and having built on prior precedent, particularly in the all grant um, initiative case. And so, so they, they work at different scale. Um, the stock market has a huge impact. Um, you know, we have, we have years like last year where, which were um, huge, huge uh, gains for the Williams Endowment, um, followed as they always are almost, uh, you can check this historically, by a year or two of um, dramatic turns in the other direction. Uh, and that's why Williams never just budgets one year. We think about three-year arcs uh, around the endowment. Uh, we we look very much not just at what's happening year to year, but at historic trends uh, to try to map out um, where we've been to help us understand uh, where the endowment will go because we are a heavily um, uh, endowment driven institution. And so it does have an impact, but I would argue that the, endow the, the way to think about the endowment's impact on our um, strategic aspirations is less year to year and more long term because um, there are going to be year to year fluctuations and we have to live inside of those budgetary um, limitations in any given year. But when we're working on long term projects, uh, we can map out things that we can do in a particular year en route to something else. So, for example, we're doing I mentioned the flexible building work. We're not actually building those buildings or even making decisions about building those buildings, but we're doing the back work so that we know when we want to build, how to think about that, how to make those decisions, um, how the strategic plan and our current um, values, but also priorities will shape decisions in the future. So um, that's why I, you know, there you could do a two-year strategic plan. You you could do a five-year strategic plan. I purposely focused on one that had a longer time frame, um, in part because of some of these questions. Uh, moving towards the the end of our list here, but uh, are there any plans to add a, a master's programs beyond the grad art or the CDE? Um, not currently. Uh, that came up as a question during strategic planning. There were definitely um, you know, educational programs at a college or university come from faculty. So they come from the goals uh, that faculty have for themselves and for the institution um, and, you know, working with um, administration and um, uh, and key partners to think about how to move them forward. And um, I had, I engaged in a number of conversations about that possibility and thinking about it. Um, but in the end, um, I think the um, decision was really to continue to strengthen and um, uh, and ensure the longevity of these two wonderful master programs that we have. Um, and we uh, we have done that in, um, in core investments in both the CD and in the grad art program, um, but not at this time to, to add new ones. Okay. Uh, looking at the time, thank you everyone for your questions and uh, my apologies to those that may have not have been addressed or answered. Um, but I'd like to move to a, a closing question, Maud, and, and that for you, is, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience today? Oh, yes. Um, I, I thank you for asking me that. I do want to just note a historic moment in the college's um, long arc, which is that uh, this is the year that we're celebrating uh, 50 years of co-education at, at Williams, um, and uh, we are doing so by um, hosting a, a, a conference at the end of the year that will um, speak to the issues of co-education and um, elevate some of the work of some of the wonderful women that have come through here. Um, but we've done this in other ways this year uh, in our bicentennial medals and in other ways. It was really a turning point in Williams history 50 years ago that that in many ways leads to my being here today, but, but many other things too, and many of you who are listening um, as well. Uh, um, and we, as we move more and more to a moment where 50% of the alumni body is, uh, where, where that parity comes to the alumni body, we're not, we're not quite yet there yet, but in a few more years, that will be true as well. So it's just, it's an exciting year uh, um, in William's history, and I'm hoping folks will participate in uh, different ways in that, in the activities around that. Um, 
Well, I, I just had one, one thing that's just popped up here. W would you be kind enough to remind us what our policies are regarding maximum debt targets for graduating students at Williams? Uh, well, our students don't, we have no loans in our packages anymore. So um, I'm gonna say zero. <laughs> this is a, <laughs> this is part of the all grant uh, financial aid move that we made last year. Um, and so we do not package um, loans into our uh, financial aid package. Families do sometimes choose to take loans on their own, but there, there's no longer part of the Williams um, financial aid package. So it's nice to be able to say zero. <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, I'll, this has been terrific. And as we, we've all seen, rather comprehensive. So, um, Maud, thank you for not only appearing with us today, but also thank you for the amazing work that you've accomplished during your tenure and, and particularly those in the last few years. Uh, on behalf of all of us in our Williams alumni family, I want to say thank you for all you do and that we consider ourselves to be deeply fortunate to have you leading our college. Thank uh, you. Uh, well, it's our pleasure. And, and, and please know that we're all here for you as, as we know that you are here for all alumni. And um, thanks to everyone for joining us today for this Zoom cast. I really appreciate it. And I, I hope to see some of you in Williamstown in November, November 12th for homecoming, or um, maybe at another in-person or virtual event down the line. So um, again, thank you, be well, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.